cell ag, as you probably learned by now, um, follows very closely the process of tissue engineering in regenerative medicine. So one of the most important and biggest challenges is um, finding ways to create the same structure of um, muscle tissue. And so that's why um, scaffolds as well as stem cells are very important. So um, how many of you eat meat? Does anyone who eats meat want regularly want to um, talk about a couple of things that they enjoy about biting into steak or biting into a piece of meat that you don't get when you buy into, for example, an impossible burger? Um, I personally think that it's really hard to mimic the texture a lot of the times and also like the juiciness. Um, I feel like fake meat a lot of the times is a lot more dry than, um, than real meat. Yeah, so the juiciness is often a very big thing because we don't have ways of um, integrating fat into the um, meat currently. Um, oh, sorry. I forgot to switch the slide. Um, so what is texture and how do we measure it? Um, I have a short video here. I hope that it plays properly. Um, this still explains kind of how um, different devices that have been created to that test the texture of food. Um, they're called texture analyzers and they're used to test the bite, the strength, um, the force it takes to pull food apart, the elasticity of food, how much water is released when pressed on it, bounce back and all these things that make something taste the way it does when you're chewing it. Um, so this is a two minute video of some of the machines. Let me know. So that's some of the machines that are used to test. And that's also what companies such as Impossible use as well to compare how their product compares to actual meat on the market, um, in addition to consumer surveys. Um, OK, so what is meat? So meat is um, made of cells and structural proteins. and Cells are expensive and difficult to grow into structured meat products the way animals do, which is why we need scaffolds. As you can see here, muscle fibers are on the scale of like 20 to 100 micrometers and collagen fibers are on the scale of nanometers. Um, and we need um, the meat that we produce in cultured um, meat to mimic this thin fiber. And um, so meat is made of mostly of um, muscle tissue, which are bundles of cells called muscle fibers. And each cell is crammed with um, different filaments, which are made of um, two proteins, actin and myosin. These allow muscles to contract and relax. Um, and that's um, what requires lots of energy, oxygen, blood, which it will all be um, uh, like supplied through the medium in the bioreactor in um, cultured meat production. Um, and so the individual protein molecules in raw meat um, are wound in coils, as you can see in this picture here, um, and they're held together by different chemical bonds. And when meat is cooked, what happens is, is that these um, protein molecules unwind and the heat also shrinks the muscle fibers in diameter and length. This is one of the things that we need meat to, cultured meat to be able to emulate um, this change in texture when heat is applied. Um, 
So a typical cut of meat, as you can see here, is made mainly of skin, skeletal muscle, connective tissue, fat, bone, and a small amount of smooth, smooth muscle, such as arteries and veins. Um, skeletal muscle is made of muscle fibers um, called fascicles, which are held together by connective tissue um, and fat. As you can see here, fascicles contain smaller muscle fibers, which are tightly packed and aligned, um, and then are fused together. The muscle, the muscle fiber consists of rod-shaped myofibrils, and myofibrils and connective tissue are the main structural components of muscle that affect the tenderness of meat. So connective tissue is composed mainly of collagen and elastin. Um, and so, for example, a lot of scaffolds are made of gelatin, which is a derivative of collagen. Um, because it has the same structural properties. And the fat is deposited as bundles between the muscle fibers, as you can see here. Um, and that's known as intramuscular fat. And then here you'll see subcutaneous fat, which is on the surface of the muscles, um, which are held together in a matrix of connective tissue. And the fat obviously um, contributes to the juiciness of um, your piece of meat, which is why it's important to have find ways to integrate the fat cells into the meat. So looking at where our uh, meat products are now compared to where we want them to be, on the left, you can see kind of the main types of alternative meat products that are currently on the market. So you have the like vegetarian or plant-based sausages, um, which essentially um, are made of like a paste of different plant proteins put into a casing. So these often also don't have the same texture as real sausages, but still it's rather, rather similar because they're made in a similar way to real sausages um, and there isn't a lot of structure needed within um, the casing. Then we have ground beef, um, which also doesn't have very um, big structural components, which is why it's also easy to emulate, which is why there's a lot of impossible um, and like Morningstar ground beef products. And then we have the chicken tenders and chicken fingers. And those are made through um, a process called extrusion. Um, and how it works is that you have this protein emulsion and it's essentially shot through an extruder um, into a bath and then stretched. And then you get these um, like kind, they feel more fibrous but the issue with the extruded products um, is that they kind of have the structure more of overcooked meat as opposed to regular meat, which is um, what a lot of consumers um, don't want in their meat products. And so eventually you wanna be able to create things like steaks, bacon, real chicken breast, um, pulled pork, and all of those require these thin fibers that can emulate the myofibrils in muscular tissue. So currently you can see we're here. We have these processed meats um, and consumers who eat meat products regularly have low quality expectations. Um, but with um, research into scaffolds, we can get to the next step would be coming to pulled meats. So this would be like taco meats, pulled pork or brisket, um, which don't require large pieces of muscle tissue, um, which is currently not scalable with the um, current technology um, because it requires more intricate technology to marble in fat. But eventually we wanna get to creating whole meats and there is, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end, um, some research being done on finding ways to create scaffolds that um, can adhere to fat stem cells and muscle stem cells. Um, so what cell ag can do to combat this issue is um, use scaffolds, which are materials engineered to cause desirable cellular interactions um, and contribute to the formation of new functional tissues. So the cells are seated on a scaffold, as you can see in this image here. Um, and they're capable of supporting 3D tissue formation. Essentially, they act as a template for tissue formation. And originally, it was used for medical applications. Um, but as we know, cell ag very closely follows tissue engineering process, which is why they're also relevant. And 
we will look at different methods of creating scaffolds and see how they could potentially increase scalability, provide structure, and improve organoleptic properties. Um, organoleptic properties, for those who don't know, are aspects of food that are experienced by our senses, such as taste, sight, moisture, dryness, bite, um, things like that. Also, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to just unmute and um, jump in. So what are scaffolds? So scaffolds are used as, as you can see in this image here, um, a scaffold is a essentially like a mesh um, structure that has pores because when you see the cells in, you need there to be pores so that the media, um, which is here described as growth factors, um, to seep through the pores and diffuse into the cell so the cells can proliferate. Um, and at the same time, you want these pores, but you also want the scaffold to be strong enough to mimic the 3D um, architecture of meat. Um, and yet yeah, the perfusion of media will allow similar vascularization um, as real meat tissue as it is um, inside an animal. Um, yeah, and um, so scaffolds are originally, um, were originally medical applications. Um, and so I'm gonna show you the design considerations um, of the medical applications of scaffolds and then we can compare that to what's needed for the food application of scaffolds. Um, in regenerative medicine, um, there are certain design considerations that need to be followed. Um, for example, biocompatibility. Um, this means that cells have to be able to adhere um, to the scaffold. They need to be able to migrate, proliferate um, the same way they would inside animal tissue. They also need to be biodegradable. Um, and this essentially is important um, because it, you don't wanna use um, toxic uh, um, resources and um, you don't want to, it to create any toxic byproducts. Um, and um, the biodegradability is also important because sometimes you'll create scaffolds that you want to degrade naturally um, to leave just the, um, cell tissue that was formed on the scaffold. Um, the mechanical properties are also important. For example, um, it needs to be consistent with um, the site of, of which you are um, creating this regenerative tissue. Um, it also needs to have structural integrity um, and um, has to be able to be surgically handleable um, since it's used for regenerative medicine. And then you have the scaffold architecture, um, which needs to allow cell infiltration and nutrient diffusion, um, as I explained um, before. Um, and it needs to be cost effective, scalable, sustainable, and utilize resources efficiently. Um, so to gain a little understanding of how tissue, in tissue engineering works with scaffolds, um, I have this diagram here. Um, just so that we can then compare it to how it's used in food products. Um, so you can see how closely um, it follows that process. Um, so scaffolds need to have a mesh network that has pores that allows cells to lie within 200 micrometers um, of the nutrient axis, um, which will come from the medium. Um, and the scaffolds also um, support organs and organ systems that are often damaged after injury or disease, which is when you would take a biopsy of cells um, from a person, isolate those cells, cultivate the cells, um, and leave them in media while you prepare the scaffold. Then um, you often also, then you must allow the cell attachment and migration on the scaffolds. Um, and this can be put in a bioreactor um, to help the proliferation of cells. Um, and um, once they're in the bioreactor, you have the nutrient diffusion um, to uh, make sure that they have all the vital cell nutrients. Um, and then you would remove it from the bioreactor, um, remove the scaffold if necessary, or implant with the scaffold um, on the site of injury or disease. 
So essentially the scaffold act as the, um, an artificial extracellular matrix. Um, and there are some scaffolds which are degradable, some which are reusable, um, and some um, that you remove and then put the tissue on the site. So looking at um, the food application of scaffolds, um, you can see that the design considerations are relatively similar. Um, although one that is different is that it has to be edible. Um, so that's important, obviously. <laughs> um, and it also, you often want acellular scaffolds um, to mimic the extracellular matrix, um, which means that there's um, no cells on it. Um, which is why, for example, with you would um, decellularize plants to use as scaffolds. Um, again, they need to be biocompatible, um, biodegradable because um, real meat products are biodegradable as well. Um, the mechanical properties, it needs to have the strength of musculature and need to have the same porosity to allow media to perfuse to the seeded cells. It also needs to be um, sustainable and usually free of animal products, um, since the objective of the industry is to create more sustainable meat products. And it needs to be cost effective and scalable. So you can see it's relatively similar to the, the medical applications of scaffolds. Um, looking at the process of cell culturing. The cell culture involves a scaffold that supports proliferation. Um, myoblasts require an anchorage. Um, and since myoblasts are capable of spontaneous contraction, scaffolds need to provide a large surface area and still be flexible enough to allow these contractions. Otherwise, um, the meshwork would break. So this is why you have to make sure. So for example, um, in the research that I'm doing for Boston Meats, I'm currently trying to find um, different possible scaffold materials that aren't brittle because brittle scaffolds will break when the uh, myoblasts um, contract. So um, one example is a collagen meshwork. Um, another example are microcarrier beads. Um, in the food industry, um, collagen meshworks are, or like meshworks are used more than microcarriers. Um, just because it's um, usually more cost effective. Um, but both of these are biocompatible and biodegradable. Um, in this diagram, you can see the collagen meshwork, um, how it's used. So the cells are um, isolated, proliferated, and then you seed the cells onto the meshwork and place it in a bioreactor. Um, then you add the medium, the nutrient supply, um, and eventually um, once enough cells have proliferated, um, you would remove the scaffold and then harvest the cells. Um, cells get fused um, to form myofibers um, due to the media, um, which helps produce the soft consistency of meat. Um, and once the cells have proliferated, um, the scaffold can be removed. Um, and there's research being done with um, degradable scaffolds, um, reusable scaffolds, removable scaffolds, edible scaffolds, um, there's a lot of different types right now that people are trying to um, innovate so that they can retain the same integrity as um, animal musculature. And the removal can be done. If the scaffold is removed, it can be done mechanically or um, enzymatically. Or actually there's some that can also be done um, simply through like a change of temperature. I have a quick question. Yeah. about that or uh, a question about the microcarrier beads like what it what exactly what exactly are those are those like really 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 like on a like are they tiny tiny or are they kind of just like the same sort of scale as the meshwork but just a different way of going about it so they're very small and so for example um i don't know if you've heard of zine zine is a corn protein and that's been used tried to be used a lot in um one type of scaffold formation using fiber spinning um, because the problem is that plant proteins often have a more, um, they have a, a different structure than gelatin or collagen in that 
they form little like globules instead of stretching. And so you want to use microcarrier beads to kind of create the the scaffolding structure and then on they're called microcarriers because they carry the other proteins and like disperse them onto the scaffold if that makes sense so they're used often in plant-based scaffolds as opposed to cell seeding scaffolds so how small are the microcarriers like can you show with your finger or something me wait sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh the microcarrier bees are like um I, I can't show you with my finger. They're very small. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, they're they're on That's the same right. scale of because it's essentially supposed to be the same way the um, muscular tree is, which is on the micrometer scale. So they would be very small. Um, they're very small. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, potential biomaterials that are currently being used for scaffolds, um, for example, some of the natural biomaterial biomaterials being used um, that make up the native um, extracellular matrix are gelatin, which is very commonly used, which is um, hydrolyzed collagen, um, which we have seen is an important component of animal musculature, um, which is why it's very favorable. Um, alginate stems from algae. Um, it's also used, although it tends to create an unfavorable color, um, which is why people don't use it often. Um, Agarose and carrageenan are used. Um, carrageenan is, um, comes from seaweed. Um, silk can be used from spiders. Um, chitosan can be used, which can come from um, crustaceans such as shrimp or crab, um, or can be created through yeast, um, or can be extracted from fungi. Um, a very popular method currently is cellulose. Um, which comes from plants. Um, so that's when you see all these decellularized um, plant scaffolds. And then you can also use fungal mycelium, um, which it has chitosan, collagen, and cellulose. Um, most of these are FDA approved. Um, you can see here a list that is on the FDA site for approved um, biomaterials, um, which um, is why they're often used because they're um, you don't have like companies don't have to worry about regulations since they're already FDA approved. Um, these are all advantageous, these natural biomaterials, because they have high biocompatibility, biodegradability, and um, low immunogenicity, which means they don't cause um, immune or inflammatory responses. Um, the most functional one currently for cell adhesion is gelatin. Um, because it's derived from the vertebrate um, extracellular matrix. Um, so it has the proper motifs that promote proper cell migration and prolif um, proliferation. Um, so for example, cell adhesion is possible on alginate or chitosan, but they often lack the same recognition motifs um, that promote also cell adhesion. Another important um, part of these networks is that um, hydrogels are often used um, instead of the single um, protein components because often these single protein components are able to create 2D cell growth, um, but often aren't effective for 3D culture. Um, this is because they often lack the desired mechanical properties and mesh network size. So as I was saying, like this is where microcarrier beads would come in and you would um, use a hydrogel to combine different proteins as they all have different um, properties and sizes that are favorable. Um, so most applied biomaterials in tissue engineering are in the form of hydrogel, um, hydrogels, um, because they're composed of synthetic and natural biomaterials. Now for um, regenerative medicine, this isn't a problem because um, synthetic materials are often used in um, uh, regenerative medicine, um, but for food products, there's um, more regulations, so it can be difficult to find the proper um, combination of materials. Um, but essentially, hydrogels allow the swelling and deswelling um, of the network um, in response to stimuli such as temperature or change in pH. And because it's aqueous, 
um, they have a high permeability for oxygen and flow of water soluble molecules, which would be the medium that needs um, to reach the seeded cells. Um, and this will help mimic the soft tissues of the body. Um, the difficult part is also that hydrogels are difficult to scale, often because they do use synthetic um, materials. Um, so they're actually not that often used in cultured meat. Um, but one example of a synthetic material that is FDA approved is um, polyethylene glycol. So that has been used um, in research for cultured meat. Okay. Um, if I, there have, are no I, have, I have one more quick okay. question about, yeah. yeah. Um, two slides ago, you were talking about potential biomaterials and also approved biomaterials. Isn't it also the case that there's some work being done with synthetic materials for the sca scaffolds themselves? And is that, is that, does that look promising at all? Or does it really look like that it's biomaterials are the way that the industry is going? Well, I think the, so I have read some papers on synthetic materials, but, and although they're favorable for a lot of the technology, um, because you can kind of, they have more of the properties that are needed because they're not naturally occurring. Um, they're often not abundant and um, that makes it difficult to be cost effective and scalable. So for example, chitosan, um, which is a natural biomaterial is um, very, or cellulose is very favorable right now because um, I think chitosan is the, I wanna say the second most abundant naturally occurring uh, material in the world. So since the cell ag industry is focused a lot on using resources more efficiently, I think that's why biomaterials are preferred. Um, but yeah, there is work being done with synthetic materials. Um, although I, I haven't worked with synthetic materials and I don't see as many papers on synthetic materials as I do biomaterials. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so types of scaffolds being used. I'm just gonna go over some of kind of the big um, areas of, of scaffolds or areas of research that are currently being done. Um, so the first one is pretty relative, uh, relevant to, um, I forget who, but I think two people said that they wanted to do decellularized plants for their project. Um, so this is a paper um, from 2014 where they um, uh, seeded a decellularized apple with mouse muscle cells. So, sorry. Um, so decellularizing plants is um, a process in which you um, chemically remove the existing nucleic acids and lipids and proteins um, to get simply the cellulose scaffold. So as you can see here, you have the leaf um, you'll, you'll enzymatically um, modify it um, so that you have this decellularized leaf. Then you can seed cells onto this. And because it has these veins, um, the medium and the nutrient supply can more easily um, transfuse to the various cells um, that you seed onto the structure. Um, and so it also allows for a more easily 3D structure. Um, so in this paper, um, they used um, a decelled apple. Um, I know one of you or two of you were talking about different possible um, plants that you wanted to use for your project. Um, an apple might be also an interesting one to use. Um, I can send the paper afterwards if anyone is interested. Um, so what they did is um, they made three cellulose scaffolds um, by um, taking off the hypanthium of the apple, which is kind of like the slice here, um, and have that act as an extracellular matrix. Um, and the apple is chosen because it has pores and air pockets that help facilitate the transport of nutrients and water throughout the tissue. Um, then um, in vitro 3D um, culture of mouse uh, muscle myoblasts was seeded onto the hypanthium apple scaffold. <laughs> um, the cells then adhered um, and proliferated in the cellulose scaffold. Um, and I think afterwards they also chemically cross-linked um, the cell structures um, using collagen 
functionalization um, to improve the surface mechanical properties. Um, because an issue with cellulose scaffolds often is that they, um, their structure is lost when, when too many cells have adhered to it, um, or the like layers of cells that are created often can um, um, lose the integrity of their structure, um, which is why then chemically cross-linking can help. Um, decellarization is often used because it's very inexpensive and um, uses renewable sources. Another um, interesting um, method is using sponge scaffolds. Um, um, this is um, a paper by Natalie Rubio. She works at the Kaplan Lab in um, at Tufts. Um, she's actually, I think, also giving a talk um, during this series, um, which would be really good. She's um, done a lot with insect muscle cells, um, which I mean, I'm sure she'll talk about it. Are actually very um, promising right now because they the cells can proliferate in a lot of different conditions and don't require very stringent um, operations, for example, in the bioreactor. Um, and they're very high in protein and nutrients, so they're very, very favorable currently. But so what she did was she created these scaffolds um, through um, um, chitosan, um, and she ins um, used insect muscle cells um, and seeded them into these chitosan sponges. I'll go over how the chitosan sponges were made afterwards, but um, essentially chitosan sponges um, can also be created by extracting um, chitin, which is often found in crustaceans such as crab, shrimp, crayfish, um, lobster, but it's also um, found in mushrooms. So she used mushroom derived um, sponge scaffolds. Um, yeah, so the way that it's made, um, as you can see here, is you extract the chitosan and eventually the freeze drying process of it is what creates this chitosan foam. Um, so you would use um, liquid nitrogen, I believe, usually um, to freeze dry it. You, I think she did it over two days um, and then you have this foam. Um, and the reason it's called a sponge is because it um, absorbs and contains water very well. Um, and yeah, this is, um, chitosan is already used often in food products, um, and it's easily accessible, it's edible, um, and it's also widely used in, um, regenerative medicine. So, um, this is why chitosan is a very, um, favorable, um, scaffold material. Um, and the freeze drying process allows the phase separation, which creates this porous microstructure. Um, and these pores allow the medium to flow through to um, uh, give the nutrients to the seeded cells. One more quick question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll keep it quick because I know we don't want to no, run out of time again. But the um, would this kind of scaffold work with, with mammalian uh, muscle cells or, and, and, and muscle tissue? Or is, it, is there something about insect muscle tissue that's different that makes this actually work? No, I think I've, well, because I was looking at papers and I'm pretty sure that I saw one with um, a couple of papers. I think it was, a uh, they used crustacean um, chitosan scaffolds, sponge scaffolds, and they seeded it with bovine cells. So it definitely works with, with mammalian cells as well. It's just um, very, uh, Rub uh, Natalie does a lot of research with insect cells, which is why I think she chose them um, because they are very favorable and um, more easily multiplied. Um, okay, but, but a similar, uh, maybe not the exact same, but a similar thing could be potentially applied to. Yeah, the, the yeah, I was, yeah. If you wanna, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to, I have the other paper with the bovine cells, which um, I could send you if you wanted. Yeah, that'd be awesome, thanks. Um. Okay, and so another um, scaffold that's used is soy protein. Um, so this was done very recently and um, they created textured soy protein scaffold um, and um, attached bovine stem cells. Um, soy protein is used because it has very high nutritional value, texture, and it's a porous protein-based biomaterial. So this is why it can um, support cell attachment and cell proliferation. 
um, the texture of soy protein um, and the bovine scaffolds was tested. As you can see here, they um, fried some of them and like in an iron cast pan, and then they gave the same color and texture as fried um, bovine muscle, uh, like natural bovine muscle. Um, so that was like a very big uh, kind of discovery that they made. Um, and um, they actually found that they had um, an efficiency rate of cell seeding um, that was greater than 80% um, without functionalization, which is means it, it didn't use a hydrogel or chemical cross-linking. So that was pretty impressive. Then another decellularized um, type is, we actually had um, Glenn Goddard speak last semester, give a talk last semester, um, but he used the extracellular matrix of a spinach leaf. Um, he comes out of a heart tissue engineering um, lab. Um, but yeah, so this was taking a highly vascularized spinach leaf and replacing the plant cells with blood vessels and cardiac cells. Um, and these blood vessels were able to grow in the spinach veins um, through the leaf and feed heart cells, allowing the leaf to function essentially the way a heart would. Um, and this innovation makes plant-based vascularization um, an even more promising strategy for getting um, blood vessels into lab-grown meat. Um, because I, as I had mentioned earlier, um, the smooth muscle tissue um, such as blood vessels is um, an important part of the structure of meat as well. Okay, so this is what um, came out of the Harvard lab um, out of which um, Boston Meats um, stemmed. So they used fiber spinning um, to create scaffolds. Um, fiber spinning is a process where essentially if you think of a cotton candy machine, you have this solution and it's of sugar and water and it's spun really fast and then it weaves this texture of cotton candy. So essentially that's what they're doing, um, but with like gelatin or soy protein and then adhering muscle cells to that. So in this image, you can see um, the scaffolds and the, the like uh, neon red lights is kind of the, is where the proteins or the cells have adhered. So what they did is they did rabbit muscle cells um, on fibrous gelatin. So they created a scalable production of microfibrous gelatin scaffolds. Um, and gelatin is a natural component of meat. Um, so they have very favorable biochemical and structural features. They used this um, spinning process um, to create um, fibers with a diameter of micrometers, um, which again is very comparable to the diameter of actual collagen fibers in meat. So this helps create that same texture um, of meat. Um, these were then cross-linked with gelatin as well to prevent fiber degradation. Um, and then um, the culture muscle cells on the scaffolds were, as you can see here, um, shown with staining. Um, oh. oh. There was another image here, but um, it's fine. What, what they did as well is um, they created calamari. So as you can see here, here's some of the fibrous gelatin. And um, the structure of it they found was very similar to um, the structure of calamari rings. Um, so they created, so they were able to, like, they fried up these gel, they created rings and then fried them up um, as calamari. Um, yeah, so this is the technology that was used to create these thin fiber constructs. Um, and once the fibers are collected, for example, here is collected in a sheet, um, it is placed in the tissue culture and seeded with stem cells. Um, yeah, and then there's another possibility of um, multi-layering these fiber spinning. So you could use electro spinning and you could essentially create, this would allow for um, like fat cells and muscle cells to create like in um, a combined scaffold, creating a scaffold that could adhere both of those. Um, and you can have different scales. So you could do a fiber network of um, nano on a nano scale and a micro scale and then combine them through multi-layer electro spinning. Um, which is where different nanofiber and microfiber polymers are electrospun um, sequentially um, in layers. 
Um, another option is mixing electrospinning, which is where um, two, um, two electrospinners electrospin um, nanofibers and microfiber polymers simultaneously um, on a collector that allows them to overlap um, throughout the, like the electrospinners move laterally um, and allows it to overlap. Um, and these techniques can um, permit or restrict certain cells from infiltrating a scaffold based on pore size. So for example, if you wanted a different type of cell um, in the center of your cultured meat, you could create um, like uh, nanoscale fibers um, in the center and then layer it with um, a different with micrometer scales and that way different cells can seep into different areas of the scaffold. Um, so, um, quick question, does that, does this work only with gelatin so far or are they looking into perfecting it with other actual biomaterials? Um, you mean the, just the, the, the electro spinning technique, yeah. Oh no, that works with um, other proteins as well. So um, the Zion electrospinning has been very um, effective. It kind of depends. There's also a lot of other types of spinning. So Boston Meats actually uses jet spinning, like wet and dry jet spinning, which is slightly different. Electrospinning uses um, a difference in voltage. And then um, so that requires the solution to have um, a charge, which is different than jet spinning, which doesn't require that. Um, so there's like different ways of spinning that are being used and being um, developed, but they've also, I, they have done a lot with pea protein, soy protein, um, gelatin, agarose. So they've done um, alginate as well. Gotcha. So, wow, yeah. that's, that's, that's really crazy. It's <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's my um, favorite of all the scaffolding techniques. <laughs> um, and then, Another one that is being used, um, which is difficult to scale, but can be very effective is 3D printing scaffolds. Um, so you have these um, bioprinters um, that allow creating vascular networks um, and cells simultaneously. So as you can see here, there's two arms and one creates this vasculature and the other prints the cell aggregates. Um, and this allows continuous medium perfusion through the printed vascular networks um, while additional tissue is being printed. Um, so this can be very effective. The issue with it as well is, as you can see the layers here, um, it often has weak mechanical properties. So you would probably have to um, cross-link it um, somehow. Um, and also um, it's um, not very scalable. But yeah, those are some of the main methods currently being used to create scaffolds. Um, these are being used, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of extrusion, but that's what's being used most commonly. It's also the way like puff cereals are made. It's the way like um, spaghetti or like dried, dried like starch products are made. And that's how um, Impossible Foods and Beyond um, make their products or a lot of their main products. Um, and these can kind of replace that um, because they have more, they create more structural integrity um, and are more intricate in the way that they create the scaffolds. Yeah, and so the future possibilities um, of meat is hopefully to create marbled cultivated meat. Um, and so um, creating composite scaffolds of different regions um, can be desirable for different cell types. So a scaffold that has regions um, of different stiffness or rigidity um, supporting both myocytes, um, the muscle cell precursors, or adipocytes, um, the fat cell precursors, can create this marbling. Um, and so, for example, a professor at UCLA, um, Dr. Amy Rowett, she's working on creating these micro scaffolds, um, which are plant based, um, and she uses them and she creates, she tries to like create different areas of the scaffold so that fat cells can adhere to some parts and muscle cells to others, which would create kind of more of this marbling texture. Um, yeah, so she uses a plant-based hydrogel of alginate and pectin. Um, yeah, that's 
um, the basics of scaffolds. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so um, one question, th thanks so much for delivering this talk to us, Jasmine. Um, one question I had was, based on the different scaffolds, is there a difference in how the cells are seated or is the process pretty similar across each scaffold? Um, the process is pretty similar. It changes in, so depending on the size of the pores in the scaffold, I think that's what um, changes because um, you need the media to perfuse through to the cells. So that would affect it. Um, but I think the cell um, adhesion is usually pretty standard, um, especially when using a bioreactor, for example. Gotcha, makes sense. So Bianca has a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Thus far, what is the most popular scaffold material in terms of combining taste, texture, and functionality? Not that I have like all the knowledge of what's the most favorable, but I think in my opinion, I think currently the easiest one is gelatin because it has the, because it comes from um, the animal. So it has the right, um, the right structure, it has the structural integrity. Um, but I guess the only issue with it would be that it's not super scalable um, or renewable. I think I think one that's gonna be really popular is the decellularized plants. I think that one has a lot of promise. Um, and then I also think chitosan works quite well. But I, I don't know like what the most preferred is. Um, there's a lot of different technologies. Um, I have read mostly about um, different spinning techniques, um, but that's also just because that's what I focus on, so. Uh, I would say that the industry as a whole is kind of at a, a very beginning place as to where each yeah. company is still kind of- Yeah, the scaffolding is pretty new, so. Yeah, so it seems like each company sort of, you know, they develop a method for Jasmine's Boston Meats company. Their big thing mm -hmm. is using this jet spinning, uh, whereas mm -hmm. other companies might want to you know, have a scaffold that has nutritional properties or, um, you know, be completely vegan kind of thing. So it's still in the works, yeah. I would say. Well, so Boston Meats, for example, they work on creating these scaffolds with jet spinning, which is a, um, they, the CTO created this technology. Um, and then there's, and they essentially want to market to other cell ad companies who want to improve their texture. And there's another company, I forget the name, that does the same thing, but they use electro spinning and they've kind of innovated the electro spinning process. So I think companies are just, or, and researchers are um, just trying to find different things that work, which is um, what I think makes it so fun is that there's so much that you can still do in the industry. And uh, building off of Bianca's question, um, you mentioned that some of your research is around like which scaffolds can afford some flexibility for if there's like muscle contractions. Mm -hmm. um, so which of the ones that you showed to us has like the most promise for like being a flexible scaffold? Oh, that's a good question. I actually don't know which one works best. Um, I think that has more to do with, less to do with what you use as the scaffold and more to do with how the scaffold is created. Um, I'm thinking in terms of like the spinning, for example, or for example, so um, if you guys know what dextran is, um, there are certain types of dextran um, which are, are used for scaffolds sometimes, but they, um, at certain solution percentages, um, it creates a very brittle scaffold. So you could adhere cells to it, but once they contract, it would break essentially. Um, so I think, all materials have, or most materials have the possibility to become flexible scaffolds. It's a matter of perfecting the percentage of the solution that's being used. Um, but for like cellulose, um, decellularized plants, um, I'm actually not quite sure. I assume they would be quite flexible, but um, I'm sure like the type of plant you use or the type of plant you decellularize would also affect that. Hey, Jasmine, uh, you wanna talk about the homework and Oh, yes. Move on to the final project. That's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So for homework, um, I put in the homework folder um, Glenn Goddard's um, paper on the spinach leaf. Um, 
I think it's a fascinating um, paper and it also has a lot of diagrams which really explain the process. Um, so especially also for those who are looking to do that for the final project, I think this would be a really good paper to read. Um, and then for the final project, um, essentially, we already did that. So um, people can start working on their projects now. And if anyone has any questions, um, me, Emily, and Sangeeta are happy to answer any questions you have or um, if anyone is looking for any resources or other papers to look at, we can also help supply some of those um, if there are no other questions. Yeah, I can. Um, so I have a few slides on what I'd like to do today. Mm -hmm. uh, can I share my screen? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, So for today, um, I wanted to keep you all on track to finish uh, the project in time to present next uh, to present uh, in week four. Um, so if you are working on a project proposal, I would propose today to think about professors relevant to your project. Uh, if you're doing a hands-on project, then start thinking about um, or continue to think about planning and ordering your materials. Um, and I did want to just say, um, now that you've created that folder um, for your projects, just keep adding any materials that you have um, in there. So if you are making notes on a paper, uh, it'll just help us make sure that you're on track um, to create your final project and uh, let us know if there's any questions. So I'll share this uh, presentation. Um, I did create a list. Oops. <laughs> I created a list of uh, MIT departments that might be useful to you all. Um, if you are at MIT, um, if you're not at MIT, then you probably know better than I do what professors are relevant to your field. Um, but here are some links to the faculty pages of different departments at MIT. Um, they all have search functions, um, so you can decide, you can uh, find your professors based on scaffolds, um, media, cell lines, what have you. Uh, so we think that finding professors relevant to your project is going to be super important uh, so that you can actually have your proposal um, come to light. and. I'll remind you all again that if you do uh, pursue a project proposal, we are excited to help you along with that process. So whether that be emailing professors, um, any, anything that we can do, finding funding, uh, we'd love to help. And then remember, this is your project subfolder I just showed you before. And remember that we also have a lot of resources that we've accumulated for you to help you with your project um, from templates of assignments to suppliers to project ideas. All right, uh, this, is, uh, we're, this is your time. If you have any questions for us, uh, suggestions uh, that you'd like to have for um, professors or project ideas, we're here. Uh, um, I have a question about the, the scaffolds. So, I mean, something is not very clear to me because in the cultural mint uh, bioprocess, we have a, a proliferation phase and then a differentiation phase. And uh, so a scaffold uh, is used only in the differentiation phase from what I understood or also in the proliferation phase. Um, for my understanding, it can be used in the proliferation as well as differentiation phase. I think okay. the differentiation depends. So that's what I was saying with if you want to to differentiate into different cell types, you can also create different, like intertwine different types of scaffolds together. Um, but yeah, from what I read, you you would seed the cells onto the structure and then have them proliferate. But you would need to proliferate them from the biopsy initially, um, just so that you have enough cells. Because if you put too many, too few cells, um, it won't, it won't take. 
Okay, okay. One Thank of the you. things that I think is super cool about Amy Rowett's work is that she talks about using geometric cues on her scaffolds um, to cause this different differentiation uh, into muscle versus fat cells. Um, so in naturally in your in a body, um, geometric cues as well as chemical as biological or chemical cues play a part in the in telling cells what to differentiate into. Um, so adding geometric cues can uh, she thinks reduce the uh, amount of growth factors and other cues you'd need that would uh, otherwise cause quite a cost. Uh, yeah, see, that's that's actually so cool thinking about ways in which you can like, because everything everything's so interconnected. So thinking about ways in which the scaffold can actually reduce the cost of what's like technically an upstream part of the process, but not, but like, it's all so interconnected that yeah, <laughs> you can find clever ways to reduce the cost and scale up from there too. Yeah, absolutely. We have, you know, a, this certain setup that makes sense for us now is uh, in an outline of the course of like cell lines, media, scaffolds, bioreactors, but all of this is interrelated. And uh, by tweaking one, you can uh, help conditions with the other. Yeah, that's what makes it, I think, so fun is that it is like it crosses over so many different areas and so many different um like areas of expertise, but at the same time, that's also what makes it difficult because if you change one thing, so like just working on one part of it is difficult because it will change depending on what kind of a bioreactor they use or what kind of stem cells they're using. So it's um like, it's all very connected, yeah, which makes it difficult, but interesting. I guess I have a question about my project. Um, Jasmine, you talked a little bit about how apple, like an apple was chosen to act as a scaffold because it's porous. In the paper that I was reading, it said that um, they prefer to use leaves or stems. So I was just wondering like what makes um, a favorable scaffold? Is it like vascular tissue or what makes it good, I guess? I think it depends on what kind you want to do. So I think the um, leaves are very valuable because they have the veins. So for example, um, wanting to create like blood vessel type things on it. So that's why like for heart regeneration, the spinach leaf was used. The apple, I guess would be the cellulose decellularized apple slice would essentially be more because it has, it has pores. Um, it doesn't really have the same like veins that a leaf does, it would be more like the sponge type where you would seed cells and it would allow perfusion um, in that sense. So I think it depends on, like, like I was saying, like uh, the type of cell seeding or the type of result you wanna see, um, but. Okay, thanks. I also have a question about my project, but more just from like, where can I, cause I, I, it's not very well developed in terms of the specific idea. I just know it's something to do with persistent fermentation. So do you A, have any leads for papers and stuff to read or a place where I can find a lot of papers on this topic? And B, is are there any professors at MIT that you know of that are currently doing a lot of work in this in their lab? Um. This is probably going to be better answered by Emily Usangita. I don't, I haven't looked that much into fermentation, but one of our other organizers, um, she's working, I believe, on fermentation as an internship right now. So I'm sure she has a lot of information on that. Um, and I can tell her to reach out to you and share some of that. Um, but I also know in um, course one, is it course one? There's that one professor who's making the silk. Um, edible silk sheets um, that uses for oh. Yeah, Benedetto Morelli. Yes. <laughs> I would say if you're, you go ahead. Okay, Benedetto, cool. Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> add that. Sorry, are you yeah. gonna say something? No, I was just gonna ask, so the, the silk is, it's created through the, the precision fermentation process, mm -hmm. I assume, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he, so he actually, his lab is all based around different applications of silk as a biomaterial. Yeah. Um, and when I worked with him, he started his postdoc uh, on this project because they just use so much silk and it's quite a labor, <laughs> laborious process to 
um, always be extracting that protein from silk cocoons. Um, wow. So it just made more sense for them that way. But yeah, it's also quite a useful scaffold or uh, precision fermentation material. That's so cool. Sorry, what, what were you saying, Sangeeta? No, no, you're good. Um, I was going to say that if you're, I guess, more interested in the, not directly precision fermentation, but the actual technologies that, you know, metabolic engineering or the synthetic biology that has to go into kind of optimizing the DNA and the RNA that goes in it. Um, yeah. Chris Boyd's group is probably a big one for the SynBio aspect. And then uh, Dr. Prather in Chemi and also the Stephanopoulos lab. Uh, they both do metabolic engineering. If that's, it's more a traditional way to, you know, produce some amount of product and uh, that can be used in cell ag in multiple applications as well. Cool. Okay, so sorry. Do, do you mind typing those in the chat? Yes, yes, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions either about scaffolds, about homework, or the final project, or upcoming lecture series? Um, if not, um, you're free to stay on the call if you do end up having questions, but um, this is at 2.30, right? Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, because MIT mm -hmm. technically like class is over, <laughs> if you need to go somewhere. Yeah, I'll go. Bye, thank you. Bye. The talk was great. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Jasmine, one, one more question I had on scaffolding. So um, if you have ones that are like decellularized plants and stuff like that, um, I, I, you showed the example of like a leaf. Is it basically like the scaffold is leaf shaped at that point or yeah. do they usually like just break it up or try to recombine it into other types of shapes? Like maybe make a steak or something? Um, so for the leaf, I think they stayed with the structure of the leaf, but for the apple one, they did, I mean, they just made it smaller. They didn't like change into anything else, but um, yeah, it, I think you, you could change the structure, um, but also like, for example, for the apple, they, they just made it smaller so you can cut it to your desired size. Actually interesting, because I don't know if you could make like a really big scaffold. You'd have to, I think, cross-link it in some way. Gotcha. And so for, for the scaffolds that aren't like biodegradable, they're basically the scaffolds that you have to remove at mm -hmm. the end of the process. Does like is the meat basically mush at that point? Like is it just a bunch of cells that aren't really attached to each other because you have to remove the scaffold? Or are there ways that they do it and it still has like some type of texture, or some type of fibers that you're building? Um, no, so that was, that's like essentially what the scaffold is for is so that it's not just a mush of cells um, because there are, is work being done where they just um, put the cells in a bioreactor and they don't have a scaffold and that creates like this mush of cells. Mm -hmm. um, but by adding the scaffold, it's supposed to um, be, be more similar to how it would um, like proliferate inside of an animal, um, if that makes sense. But for uh, example... Marianne Ellis, she gave a talk and they, they had these like circular scaffolds where the cells would adhere inside and kind of create like a rod like shape and then they would remove the scaffold and it would stay in that shape. Okay, cool. So even if you're removing a scaffold, like, mm -hmm. it's not the, supposed the to cells like keep their shape, but it doesn't have to be biodegradable yeah, for the cells, for cells too. Yeah. So for example, at Boston Meats, we are not doing like removable scaffolds or biodegradable ones. They would stay in the final product. I mean, it's it's biodegradable in that like it, it will degrade in your body, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Biodegradable. <laughs> I just think that it, it's like if it were on the like in nature, it would degrade. <laughs> but there are ones that you remove and ones that are supposed to be self de um, degradable. Yeah. All of the synthetic ones, right, are removable. Yeah. Like they're they're not part of the consumer. Okay. And the the removable ones are like the synthetic ones. Are, are they? reusable too like you can remove it and then you can do like another round of cell I think seeding after that 
some people are trying to do that. I, I have questions about that because I'm not quite sure how that works, but, and I would love to learn more about that. But I know that, yeah, like Mary and Alice's um, lab, she's working on reusable ones. Um, I, I haven't come across a lot of papers about reusable ones, but would be cool if that was a possibility.